What's the point of Café Sci? Um, it's about creating space where young people can talk about the science that matters to them, not just what's on the curriculum or in the textbooks. Café Sci. Usually we do it in schools, but today we thought we'd try something different, so we're at a music and arts festival. Go, cool, what happened to love? Hello, ladies. Can we interest you in a discussion about the science of love this afternoon? Can we persuade you to come to a discussion about the science of love this afternoon at two o'clock? Uh, I'll think about it. Yeah? So I think, I think to myself of what happened to love. She stays in me still. It must be empty in you. Well, I just wouldn't know what to do. The whole idea is to connect teenage culture with science because science is a part of everyday life. It sounds weird but science and technology are everywhere from climate change to computer games, MySpace, Size Zero, obesity, love, lust, depression, dreams, everything has got a science side to it. Have you got any thoughts about love at all? Not that I can say on camera. Not that you can say on camera. <laughs> no <Yes>. girlfriends. <laughs> Pardon? No girlfriends. No yeah, I've got a girlfriend. You've got a girlfriend? Yeah. Do you love her? Yeah. Alright, so let's get going with the topic then. We've called this the science of love. Why do we fall in love? Now, love is not an exact science. It's really hard to measure precisely. It's really hard to assess objectively as you probably all recognise. We haven't really even got an agreed definition of what love is. But the general consensus among scientists now is that because love is a human process, a natural phenomenon, it's governed by the same laws that govern the rest of the universe. But whether or not you agree with that is up for discussion today. Is love something that we can apply the laws of science to? We'll look at whether opposites attract and um, the three stages of falling in love. So if any of you are in love, or fancy somebody, or think one day you might be in love, this is the place to be this afternoon. Um, I'm going to start by asking that question then. Has anybody here ever fallen in love? Anybody willing to admit it? What, what about you then? What attracted I mean, you? The kind of the thing that sparked it off with me was when I was sat round a bonfire with people and it was dark and I didn't particularly know she was sat next to me and I had my, uh, my guitar and I started singing a song and she started singing along next to me and it kind of, just uh, like to hear her voice with mine, something like that kind of you know, did something for me and after that I went to try and find her again and I don't know, you know, it seems like nothing but that seemed to be the thing that kind of sparked off the falling in love for, for yeah. me. But that's because like, music's so big for me, yeah. and it was like a special song. So. But that's really interesting, because that does actually reflect what scientists believe goes on when we meet someone that we're attracted to. Because there's this old idea that opposites attract, but they found out that actually, in terms of character and physiology, opposites don't attract. You're looking for somebody who's like you, character-wise, so maybe that's why the music thing yeah. kicked off. It's like understanding and appreciation. Yeah. Which makes sense, really, doesn't it? I mean, if somebody is really into football and their girlfriend hates it, it makes it difficult. But what's really interesting also is that it seems on a physiological level we're looking for people that look like us. Apparently, you're more likely to share the same size of earlobe, the same size of middle finger, the same waist circumference. Are these kind of big enough percentages for it not to just be like coincidences? Yeah, they are. Yeah. What about those couples that you see? It's like this massive, enormous woman and it's so like, <laughs> weird well, little guy walking around. Yeah. <laughs> I totally agree with you and that's why I mean I think at the end of this um, this discussion I would come back to the anomalies that we all of us know in relationships. There's um, a key ratio, the waist to hip ratio that men find most attractive is 0.7. So if you got my waist measurement and divide it by my hip measurement, that's my ratio. It's so 0.7 and they found that all the Miss Americas going way back have that ratio of waist to hip and it's because the narrow waist, wider hips, you're fertile. <laughs>
in mine. Isn't there something called the um, golden ratio? It's like 0.69 something or other. And that's like, it's between like here and here and it's all over your body. Yeah. And all stuff in nature. Like, yeah. 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 There is. And however close you are to the ratio, the number of the ratio is how attractive you are. Yeah. And all the different like, That's aspects. right. The gap between your eyes and there. And um, like, People always say that like when people fancy each other, they act like they like hate each other, or they um, like hit each other or whatever. And it's like to touch the other, okay, that sounds wrong, but no, no, you know, <laughs> to like touch the other person or whatever, and um, act like you really hate the other person. Yeah, I think that's that. Oh, sorry, I think that's quite true actually. I'm not sure if anyone's done any study on it, but certainly in any workplace or at school or at university, you can often tell the couple that really fancy each other because they're constantly sarky like knocking each other and it's just a way of communicating keeping the constant communication without being baboons. open baboons like, do they do it as well just around and stuff. <laughs> okay <laughs> fair enough well baboons lead us neatly on to um the biology of love the biologists believe there's three stages of falling in love um the lust we mentioned that gets you out there that's a drive like hunger or thirst testosterone estrogen gets you looking <coughs> then you meet someone, all the factors we talked about before mean you're attracted to them. And that's when the pleasure chemicals st um, kick in, they stimulate your brain's pleasure centre. And the final phase of falling in love is this attachment phase, <coughs> where the oxytocin, the post-orgasmic chemical, kicks in. And that's the chemical that you can observe in couples who've been together a long time, rather than couples who've been together only a short time. And that chemical is given to you by your body in order to keep you together until, you're old, until your kids are old enough to leave home, basically. And after that, you do what you like. The body doesn't care. Which is quite a cynical way of looking at it, but it does seem to be what we most recently have found about love. Love is different for like, each person. Then um, there can't really be an exact science for it. So, yeah. They can't really. Yeah. It's different for each person. Do you think it's because we're such, we're because we are all so different physically and internally? Is that why you can't have a science of it? Yeah, I think it's really hard to define because everyone's so different. Okay. And because love means something different to everyone else. Who? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it's worth exploring though? Or should scientists just go? All right. Okay. We can't do this love stuff. It's interesting. Like, yeah. Looking into it, but I don't think anybody should say this is what it is. So I'm afraid there's no answer to the question what makes us fall in love. And that's often the way with the cafe size. You start with a question, but you don't end with an answer. But hopefully you go away with that question and maybe just think about it a bit more when you're at home. I'm a head teacher and what I really like about Cafe Scientific is the fact that the youngsters do everything for themselves. They plan it from beginning to end. They choose the topics, they choose the things that they're interested in. It's not teacher-led. We're not imposing it on them. It's things that they want to know about, things that they're interested in. And they gain such a lot of knowledge, skills and experience about how to plan and organize an, an event. They're engaging with real scientists on, a, on their level. And that can only be a positive thing which they can take forward to either university or whatever else they might do in their lives.